Hello? Whoa! <laughs> I do like this idea of uh, fading out the music and then coming in and then having the thing that I created wiped to the side. It's, it's quite fancy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We have uh, two view viewers in here. How Howdy? How oh, it's Howdy. I get it. Jesus Christ. I uh, did not comprehend that when I first read it. <laughs> I got a haircut, so that's nice. Look, look at this. Look at this thing. Look at this. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, we have with those, you know, store-bought clippers that you can do. So I didn't go to a barber or anything like that. But I'm here uh, with Elrond. Say hello to everyone, Elrond. Hello, everyone, Elrond. <laughs> and uh, the plan for today... Well, I guess first I want to say we, we did make affiliate status... I, I don't uh, say hi Simone. I <laughs> I don't have anything for it yet. The my week got a bit cluttered because my son poured water on a, or spilt water on the laptop, the work computer, and that kind of like took over uh, my life <laughs> with anxiety and other stuff. So I haven't gotten around to figuring out the whole like emotes or what uh, being an affiliate means. But as you can tell, probably it says somewhere on my page here, it says gift a sub 20%, that kind of fun oh, stuff. I was going to say, you want to know what being an affiliate means? Check this. Watch this. Wait. You, yeah, but like, don't... Wait. No, wait. Bam. Oh. Bam. Look at that. Yeah, but now I don't even know what it means. <laughs> I don't know what it means. Yeah, subscription. It means that subscription. every time you go live... Right, okay. I'm gonna get notified. All right, and then uh, I'll, I'll never watch. That's how the subscriptions work. But but do you do you have to pay money for that? Uh, so for those of you who are in the chat with Amazon Prime, <laughs> you can use your one time a month Prime subscription to subscribe to Imperial News. Never miss out a beat as Jody takes us through new reactionaries, debate bros, <laughs> and all sorts of mythical things. Use your subscribe with prime now and get benefits such as no emotes that's it <laughs> well i mean the emotes will be coming like but what is what is like so it says gift a sub 20 percent off like I, I don't know what any of that means and, and isn't there like tiers that people can buy into as well like i, I think there's ways that like this uh monetizes your account but i'm i'm so yeah. i'm such a boomer with this <laughs> i don't even know what the hell's going on so anyway my plan is tomorrow I will be researching all about it and hopefully have a couple emotes in case people wanted to uh, subscribe. I, I, do, I do have the perfect Ezra face I know I want, and there's going to be probably Menzoid faces and, and fun stuff like that. But uh, thank you for getting me to affiliate status, everyone who's watching. And if you know anyone, uh, please recommend the show to them, and then we will have more followers, and we will all have a fun time. So my plan for today, in terms of content, I found this wonderful video. I haven't watched the whole thing. I've just, I skimmed it a bit. But apparently Rebel News is hiring. <laughs> and so uh, they created a kind of like four-minute advertisement, four- to five-minute advertisement uh, promoting their... Uh, or, or encouraging people to apply for jobs on their thing. So we're going to watch that and have a chuckle, hopefully. And then I have a video, because last time, last Wednesday, the last time we did the Wednesday stream, some we watched this video by some dude named Charlemagne, who was a neo-reactionary. And Charlemagne had this, he was talking about the trichotomy, which was uh, a mish of uh, traditionalism, uh, economic conservatism, techno-capitalism, and uh, what, was the, what was the other third part? It's the traditionalism, the techno-capitalism, oh, and then the ethnic uh, nationalism stuff. And this created a trichotomy. Uh, I think the, the pa patriarchy came in with traditionalism. Vienna. Uh, and so while we were watching that, somebody in the chat recommended that we check out this person called Settler's Lament. And this is apparently someone in Canada who is also a neo-reactionary. And he released a fun video. <laughs> he, 
he released a fun video. Uh, critic. So this is going to be interesting because he's criticizing Ben Shapiro's facts and logics argument, but he's doing it from a neo reactionary perspective, and I'm very curious to see how that goes. I have not watched it. I I will warn everyone in advance though. <laughs> oh hey, famous ones. I, I will I will uh, warn everyone in advance though. The guy's voice is pretty boring, so we'll have to try to like yuck it in between to to p give them some pep. Glad to see you got some good numbers tonight. Nice. Oh, yeah, eight viewers. Look at that. I wasn't even paying attention. All right, so we're going to jump. And then and then we might check out some impeachment stuff. Uh, I, I haven't been paying attention all day today, so I don't know how the impeachment stuff went or any of that. But uh, there might be some good content there. And if not, we'll, we'll just end it. I know Bad Praxis is streaming tonight, so we'll likely send some love off to them. Anyway, so let's go... Uh, Let's go watch this uh, Rebel News advertisement. <laughs> I should share it with uh, Elrond in the chat here. And then we'll be good to go. So for those who don't know, I do a podcast. The Imperial News Podcast. And we cover Rebel News, which is a Canadian far-right outlet. And so every Friday is usually when I do Rebel content. But this one looked too delightful that I wanted to cover it now and plus it's really short so here we go so i believe that over the last 10 months Cheers. rebel news i mean we've done more news than ever we've got more videos a day than ever in fact we've set up a, a second youtube channel just for little clips because we were overloading the main channel you can find that on our oh, youtube shit. page here's a look at it here but we we're doing more journalism than ever. As you know, over the last 10 months, we've hired new reporters, Tamara Ugolini, Drea Humphrey, Andrew Chapados is now. So we have more talent producing more content than ever. Lincoln J did his first video. Um, but I- I didn't even hear what he said there. This is someone I've never heard before. But I think that- Wait, in, um, Lincoln Jaden? So we have more talent producing more content than ever. Lincoln J did his first video. Lincoln um, Jay, I don't know who that person is, but, but I think new that content. in terms of the measurement of our efforts and our spending of our budget, we are actually a civil liberties group first. In one terrifying month, we recently spent $189,000 on lawyers. When you're literally representing a thousand or more people. So this is where things get really confusing in terms of what they're doing as a company because earlier during like when the pandemic first started he made a big scene about how rebel news was going to go under because of, of the the restrictions and stuff like this due to covid uh or not go under but like he he fear mongered about that about like he doesn't know about how well business is going to do uh as this virus sort of like gets unleashed on the public and he he did that to try to use it as like a marketing opportunity to get donations from his fans or whatever and then it was like really clearly like a few months after that he hired all the staff in the summer of 2020 which are some of the people that he just listed out there as people who just newly joined his team so and then and then and we're going to get to it, I think, later in this video. But like around Christmas time, they also put out a statement saying they couldn't pay their mortgage. Like somehow the bank like recalled a loan and they had to pay it right away. And so they needed to raise three hundred and eighty thousand dollars and petitioned their audience to to pay their rent, basically. And then on top of that, he's fighting he's fighting a, a constitutional challenge after he broke third party election by uh, of like uh, election rules. So he violated third party election rules in Canada, which is that you can't you can't like advertise for a political party during a political election unless you register as a third party advertiser. And they didn't do that. And they had signs comparing Justin Trudeau to uh, Tony Soprano, basically. And those were like put all like he, they created yard signs so that during an election, when other people had yard signs for all the other campaigns, people would have their uh Libranos, Trudeau's, Tony Soprano signs, right? And so they're fighting a constitutional challenge there. That alone is going to cost like $100,000. Then they're fighting a constitutional challenge in Saskatchewan to remove the lockdown restrictions in Saskatchewan. So they, they planned a speaking event with somebody named Patrick Moore 
and it was before the lockdowns came into place. And then they haven't been able to reschedule it because of all the lockdowns. And so they're now filing a constitutional challenge, citing that this goes against their charter rights of freedom of assembly uh, to put on this thing. And because of the lockdowns, they're not allowed to do it. That's the argument. But they're throwing down again. Uh, that's going to cost another like 100 grand for lawyers and legal fees. It'll get Patrick Moore's a piece of shit too. If, he's the one I think. Uh, there's a great clip of him with some like French scientist who tells him to drink glyphosate, and he's like, "Well, I couldn't drink glyphosate," and then he like refuses to do it, uh, even though he's like saying that it's like safe to drink. It's a great clip. But so they're they're throwing out all this money. Oh, and and again, another expenditure we covered uh, on Friday. When he paid for private investigators to fly drones over Mayor Tory uh, of Toronto, Mayor John Tory of Toronto, they paid for drones to fly over John Tory's like Florida uh, party house that he owns. I mean, like, again, it's pretty fucked up that a mayor is uh, rich enough to own a Florida home, <laughs> but uh, they paid a private investigator and I think they bragged on their show that it cost them $10,000 to hire all these private investigators to fly drones over this dude's house. <laughs> my jaw dropped when I heard that. Yeah, it's uh it was and, and the video was like insane too because you see the dude there was like one footage of the dude leaving on a bike and then clearly could he like hear the drone and is like looking around and uh then realized that it was a drone and covered his face and Ezra's like it's clearly they know we're on to them. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, I'm like, I don't know. If a drone was randomly following me, I'd be freaked the fuck out too. <laughs> uh, but they're spending all this money. And, and uh, they're still claiming that they have no money. And yet here they are again, hiring more fucking people. So there's something up with this. And... I, I mean, I, I don't have, uh, you know, resources to dig into this myself, but like if any, if any journalist is watching this, there's like issues here involving like, where are they getting all this funding? Are they purely getting it from the like crowdsourcing of the people who donate to their show? Which I don't know, based on their like clicks and stuff on YouTube, I don't think they get that much traffic, but I don't know. Uh... And so, like, I'm curious about their funding sources, and it would be nice if there were some people, journalists, with the ability to look into it. Because, I mean, there's other questions. I mean, there's there's definitely ethical problems in trying to say, like, we're going out of business and using that to guilt trip uh, your audience to, like, donate money to you. But then there's also cases where it's like, if you really don't need that money, and you're making a show for it, it almost reminds me of someone like lying that they have cancer to get like money off like a GoFundMe or something. There's like a, a like I don't know if it's illegal or not illegal, but it's like it's it's at that like those ethical edges that make me very uncomfortable, you know. And so uh, yeah, I, I have questions. <laughs> I have questions that I'll probably never get the answer to, you know. That's what it's like constitutional challenges, uh, fighting police who were beating us up here in Canada. Be right, I forgot in my long spiel, the whole point that he brought up was they're paying, he said he spent $180,000, they're doing these fight the fines campaign. So the other thing they're spending money on is everyone who gets like a, a fine for not wearing a mask or uh, having a public gathering with more than the record, or like the legislated amount of people that can meet all at once. He's telling people not to pay those fines and then is paying for the lawyers to fight these fines in courts. So that's, he's already got, he's saying he's also blowing $180,000 on that. Beating up our guy, uh, Avi Yemeni in Australia, we have become the civil liberties law firm. Avi Yemeni, convicted white beater. the Canadian Civil Liberties Association would be. You know, I'm a dues paying member of them. I don't even know why they haven't done a darn thing. But we have, there's so much work to do and so many things, I think the rebel, uh, paradoxically, or maybe uh, it's not a paradox at all, we have had our most important year yet. That's not a paradox. It's actually easy to understand. And so we're hiring. Can I draw your attention to this page? I don't know if you've ever looked, but Rebel News has... <laughs> I mean, is it there... Oh, point? hell yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I do want to point out, of course, they, they're going to have an intern position. 
Of course, because God forbid you actually pay people for their fucking work. Hold on, hold on. Maybe, maybe it's a paid internship. We should, we should learn okay. some more. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're gonna offer a cool Dude, five bucks an hour or whatever research. you do can we, get away with. Go to the website. What do we? It's uh, Rebel Let's Careers. Rebelnews.com slash careers. Careers. There was something Let's to say two seconds ago, though. One second. Damn. And so we're hiring. Can I draw your attention? Oh, he was talking about how this was like his uh, his greatest year. His greatest year of all time, right? And uh, <laughs> there's like some... Uh, I mean, I doubt it. I think that they were way bigger, I think, in the lead up to uh, 2016 during Trump's election. I mean, that's when they had Lauren Southern, Faith Goldie, Gavin McGinnis, which were all like huge draws to, to Rebel News. And if you go back and you look at like old Gavin McGinnis videos, like they're killing it in the numbers. And his never cracked like 100,000, like ever. I wouldn't say ever. There's a few of them, like the the one, the Chinese files or whatever, which got up to 200,000. But even then, like, that's nothing compared to what Gavin McGinnis was drawing in. And for those who don't know, Gavin McGinnis, creator of the Proud Boys, got his start on Rebel News. So uh, we can officially say that Rebel News was the birthplace of a terrorist organization. <laughs> Hooray! That's not a factually inaccurate statement, yeah. though. <laughs> not anymore. Not in Can't Canada. sue you for that. <laughs> Can't sue you for that one. Uh, and and for those of you looking for an internship, uh, according to Ezra, compensation will be provided at a modest rate. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Free coffee. A modest rate. Free coffee for forty hours. They want five hundred about five hundred words for like five separate questions, including the application, like. Why do you want to work for Rebel News? What is the largest issue facing the average Canadian? Who is your favorite historical figure, Robert E. Lee? How do you get your news? <laughs> Describe one opinion you have that almost everyone else did, disagrees with. Wait, did they seriously ask you a question about Robert E. Lee, or did you just sneak that in? No, I snuck that in. No. God damn it. <laughs> Don't sue me. I'm just, I just offering an example. Was... As an example, you could choose Robert E. Lee. You know, you did not say you have to, but, you know, it's an idea. I was hoping so much that Robert E. Lee was one of the fucking examples. Jesus Christ. Uh, yes, and like part of me, you know, I have like I'm almost certain that Ezra knows who I am because he blocked my Imperial News account and my personal uh, Twitter, which I don't use anymore. But I was gonna save it as a backup, anyways. But he blocked me on both accounts, and he blocked uh, Caitlin's uh, private account. Caitlin's my co-host on the podcast. And uh, Sheila Gunn Reed, who's one of their correspondents, has also blocked me. So I'm pretty sure they know who we are. <laughs> Which, you know, you get somewhat nervous given like the litigious nature of this guy. But we've been pretty uh, upfront. Like, we don't hide anything because we, we listen to what he says and we just state uh, what he says, you know. But part of me is like, oh, wouldn't it be fantastic to apply for this? <laughs> apply under a fake name. I know, but it, it would end... It would end pretty quickly, I think. I don't know if... Uh... Plus, I think one of the positions is is in Ottawa. We're going to find out. The other position... Well, well, we'll let him explain it. Pay your attention to this page. I don't know if you've ever looked, but Rebel News has a careers page. Look at that. We have some administrative positions. I need a, uh, an assistant to help keep me organized. I'm a little bit disorganized. There's so much going on to help book the travel and the company and help take care of administrative things. But in addition to that administrative position, can you see? So we got Montreal. There's a China affairs reporter, Ottawa-based reporter, content writer, and web editor is probably the only one. <laughs> China affairs, yeah. Jeez, that one worries me the most out of all of them, especially who's going to apply for that shit. See, we're hiring video editors, web editors, and we're looking for three new. Oh, I should be the executive assistant. I think I've told you that before, but I want to bring to your attention. Rebelnews.com slash careers, where you can see all the openings, including in terms of on-camera journalists. We're looking for someone to cover Parliament in Ottawa. Now, we've been looking for that for a couple months, but we haven't filled it yet. <laughs> I wonder how much of that is just like no one's like... Uh, there, there's going to be a combination of like no decent person is going to apply for this position. But I think like 
there's probably people who have applied for it that you could clearly tell were not the types of people you want, <laughs> you want uh, to have that job. Like, like there's an element in which it, it, it reminds me of like them going to like a lot of these anti-mask rallies and clearly like wanting to grift off them. But like you, you know, some of the types of people that show up to this thing could never uh, hold the job as adequately as some of the people on the rebel staff do. Right, not not to say that the rebel staff have talent, but they're not like uh, so out there that they're <laughs> they're incoherent or are uh, running around like destroying things. Kind of like out, they're they're not at the level of some of Alex Jones's staff and Alex Jones himself. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that I'm I'm sort of like positioning them against. They seem to have at least some sense with them. They might poach some reporters from InfoWars. Well, I'm pretty sure he's been trying to get a job at InfoWars, Info which is why Ezra's been on their show uh, several times within the past year. We're looking for someone in Quebec who would know French and English. They would do their reporting in English, but I would want them to know French so they can talk to the other half, you know, read the French papers, etc. And you see there, we're looking for someone to be our China affairs correspondent. So they don't have to be Chinese Canadian, but it would probably help if they know the Chinese community and can read Chinese. Because I want this position to. The position will also be an advocate for democracy in China and defender of the people who are persecuted by the CCP. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Such as Hong Kong democracy activists and ethnic and religious minorities, both abroad and in Canada. Duties will include monitoring China's influence in Canada, including Chinese language news media in Canada, in Canadian universities, and other targets of CCP influence. I also love just like the very Western idea of like Chinese. Do you know Chinese? Yeah. Not like not like Mandarin. Mandarin. Yeah. Not like Cantonese. But yeah, not like it just any says fluency in Chinese, in Chinese language. Chinese. <laughs> They, listen, I'm not I'm not knocking Ezra. I'm just saying it probably doesn't bode well for your understanding of China. You know, <laughs> that language saying. they speak. <laughs> Chinese language, you know. Oh, that's funny. You know, the mis Mr. Miyagi language. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> Come on. Holy shit. That almost tells me that, like, someone could go in there and, like, offensively, like, make up uh, a Chinese accent and just say things, and Ezra will be like, Oh, my oh. God, yeah. Because <laughs> how would he know? Could you imagine? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you can hear the Chinese language. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, my God. We, if I had a bigger reach, I would totally be directing people to apply for these jobs. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. Follow the Chinese language newspapers. Uh, follow what the Chinese embassy in, is doing in Canada. See what's going on on campuses. Where, you Chinese. know, the, the rich kids, sons and daughters of high Communist Party officials, send their kids to university in Canada. There's almost 100,000 children of Communist Party bosses in China going to school in Canada. And they're not just learning in our schools they're having a political expression they are being abusive in some cases towards the protesters falun gong uyghurs tibetans so we're looking to hire a china yeah they've, they've done some reports that i haven't dug, dug into uh in part because i find it hard to research and i highly doubt what their reporting is accurate but about like uh, abuses from like chinese schools especially in the vancouver area and I find it hard to research them, for one, because I personally don't speak, uh, I don't speak the Chinese language. <laughs> uh, Alex fired David Knight recently. He wants his own baby person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but didn't, so in terms of, like, Alex firing David Knight and therefore Ezra can go work for InfoWars, I'm pretty sure, did they, what was, because what's, what's the other asshole? The, <laughs> the guy who, who admitted that he was, like, using Alex this whole time? I forget his name. Steve. Is it Steve? Shit. Oh, that's going to break my mind. I should know it. Uh, Steve Pachenik. Yes, Steve Pachenik. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
Steve, uh, like, didn't Alex offer him a job, too? Like, I can't remember. There was the whole fallout, and then, like, Steve Pachetic said he was using him the whole time, and then they came back on. I don't know what the hell's going on there. But, uh, <laughs> he's been on, yeah. Uh, but, it, like, in terms of, like, the Epoch Times, too, that you're saying there, the, the Epoch Times, I mean, they, they used to guest on Ezra's show all the time, but... They kind of stopped doing that right when the shift... Because, like, they used to be sort of like, the virus is really bad and we need to take it seriously, COVID, when this thing first uh, broke. But then around April, May, their uh, whole position switched to being the virus isn't real and it's all just a conspiracy. These lockdown things are bullshit. That's... Not that the virus isn't real, but like it, it's they don't take it as a reality in the way that scientists uh, think that lockdowns are effective or masks are effective and stuff like this. So that's like the way they went. And when they went in that direction, they kind of dropped the whole like China secretly developed it in a lab conspiracy. And because of that, they stopped really talking with Epoch Times people on their show for some reason. Uh, I think they've only, I mean, they still bring up China occasionally, but it's very brief. When I remember back when this uh, pandemic started, it was like China, 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 like all fucking time. And it was starting to get like really repetitive and boring when we were covering it. Uh, but it looks like, I mean, it's clear they still really want to push that China angle. It's just now, now it's around, uh, you know, when he has the China files, it's now around this idea that somehow... Chinese and Canadian military are in bed with each other or some shit like that. Or that we're, we bring Chinese soldiers over here to train them in our winter conditions so that they can fight India over the Himalayans. That's his <laughs> new conspiracy theory. When it hit Europe... Oh, yeah, yeah. Chinese affair correspondent. They're probably going to wind up being a Chinese-Canadian who's yes. familiar with that culture <laughs> and language. It doesn't have to be, but you do have to know the Chinese language. That's a very exciting position. I hope we fill it soon. Um, and one of the reasons we're able to do this is because so many of our viewers This is the most depressing moment. Pick them over Christmas. As I th so this was their whole thing about, you know, help, the bank called in our loan, which is, it was just such an absurd story. And it says we have to pay off approximately 195000 by December 28th, and we have to pay off another 185000 a month later on January 28th. And so they needed $380,000. And they raised, according to their website, $451,812, which is a lot of fucking money. And that's also, if you do the math, <laughs> more than $380,000. So he's saying with this like difference, they now have some like extra money to spend on employees. I think you remember our banker called in a three hundred eighty thousand dollar loan, which we had hoped we would just roll over, but he wanted his money out, and our rebel viewers paid down the bills, and so we're debt free and we're able to make a go of it and spend make a go our money. Of it on expanding our journalistic work and our civil liberties work. I'm very excited about it. Um, and I mean, we're still sort of figuring out who we are. It's going to be a sixth <laughs> birthday next week. Oh, and I think the Rebel has transformed itself several times over the last six years. I think right now we're an important anti-censorship civil liberties force as well as journalism. Six years of the Rebel, dear Lord. But... Uh... <laughs> Congrats. Congrats, the Rebel. Six years. Uh, they always make liberals seem cooler than they are. Yes, I know. They're all secret communists that are going to give us free everything. Only they get elected and don't do that. It's very disappointing. All right. That's enough for the, the Rebel. We are now going to... And, and again, I pre-warn. I pre-warn that this dude, from what I, I've seen... I've only seen one of his videos before. And they're not videos. I don't think there's going to be any video to this. This is going to be the screenshot we're probably looking at for the whole video. This is the kind of content this uh, dude creates. This, uh, <laughs> the only other video I watched of this uh, guy is he did a video addressing Vosh, who was addressing uh, Elliot Page coming out as trans. And his position was that 
you know, it, credit where credit's due, I guess. This person did not dead name Elliot and did not misgender Elliot, but then agreed with Vosh on one point. So at one point, Vosh said something like, the left is kind of winning the culture war because when Elliot Page came out, it was mostly supportive. Like all the news coverage, most of the people talking about it. I mean, other than Chuds, like obviously, you know, your Ben Shapiro, your Steven Crowder, they of course are, are not going to be cool with this and are going to make shitty videos. But the majority of uh, the mainstream culture seems supportive. And so this dude agreed with Vosh on that point, but of course agreed with him in kind of like a negative way, such that uh <laughs> such that this is indicative of like cultural decay and we're we're reaching like uh the peak of decadence and societal collapses and coming and all this fun shit so this is a uh, settler's lament who's apparently a canadian neo-reactionary and sadly his channel gets like like even this video i think it was something like three thousand views uh which you know i can only dream that my content gets three thousand views which is just sad that like, there's there's people out there that are going to watch this. And so we're going to learn. And the, the reason why I found this video, so this is one of his most recent videos. And the reason why I wanted to watch it in particular is because I, I personally have a problem with debate bros. <laughs> I can't stand debate bros. And you do. You, you really have a problem. You have, <laughs> you have the, the biggest like mosquito bite about it. Like it is just an itch you have to scratch. <laughs> and I hate debate aesthetics. And the thing is, so for those, I've brought it up on the show before, I have a master's in philosophy. I've taught critical thinking for several years. Oh, here we go. I was doing my doctorate in philosophy before I dropped out due to financial reasons and stress. And so I am someone who I do enjoy, I do enjoy some facts and some logic <laughs> and have taught it. <laughs> so... As much as I like facts and logic, I I hate the way this like debate culture uses that stuff because they often don't use it correctly, and that drives me fucking crazy. But then they also are uh, employed in ways that are toxic, you know. And that gets into this whole like facts don't care about your feelings bullshit because clearly feelings matter and all that fun stuff. So the interesting thing is what I get from the first few little bits that I listened here is. This guy, Settler's Lament, is going to be arguing against the facts and logic position, but doing it from a neo-reactionary perspective. <laughs> and so it's uh, 10 minutes long, and we're going to see where he goes. But again, apologies. His voice, again, I don't even know how 3,000 people listen to this, because just pay attention to this dude's voice. Among mainstream conservatives... There is one particularly bad type of Jesus. conservatism. It's some Oh wait, I didn't share the, the video with you. Here, let's, uh... No, I, I could see it. I'm listening. Oh, I did share I'm, it. Oh, look at that. I'm here. I'm... Magic. I'll be right back, though. I'm going to grab a pillow and a blanket. <laughs> I'm going to pass out. All right. Let me know if you can hear it, too, because it's, it's really kind of shitty. Here. Well, we'll lose that five seconds. Among mainstream conservatives... There is one particularly bad type of conservatism. It's somewhat difficult to explain exactly what this type of conservatism or so-called conservatism is like, <laughs> but I think it we is can. best typified by people like Ben Shapiro, in particular with his catchphrase, particular, facts and logic. <laughs> now, obviously, there is nothing in itself wrong with either facts or logic. And it Agreed. is certainly true that coming to any correct conclusion about a worldview or a particular set of policies would be reliant on both facts and logic. But there is something about this mantra, about this aesthetic, which is really harmful to real conservatism. The problem is <laughs> that it is implying that the principal difference between the left and the right is that the left just doesn't understand its facts and logic well enough. That Interesting. So I'm just going to pause it there so we can get a, oh a little bit of a burn. <laughs> Please, yes. Thank you. We'll get so some like, dynamic I, vocal I, range. <laughs> I, I just wanted to get that out. Like, I, I'm not making fun of this person's voice. I'm making fun of the delivery because that cadence is so 
it's like a metronome going back and forth. And as you already mentioned, there's no like dynamic range. And so that's like, again, that's not like a Chris, that's not a criticism of you personally, dude who made the video. Um, that's just like a, this isn't jiving with me. Uh, it's going to be a no for me, dog. Yeah. Um, but you know, word up to 3000 viewers. That's more than I get. So go for it. Yeah. Do it's, you. It's, it's more, cause it's not even like a, a slam against the content. I mean, like we are probably going to, well, the well, let's wait. <laughs> Just or maybe not. I don't know. As it's going so far, we might find a less disagreeable in this video than we did with the trichotomy bullshit. Uh, and then I'll have to dig up some more settler lament to get the, the full picture. <laughs> but it's it's like if you want to grow an audience, you at least have to be like emotive or express. I mean, this is like the whole reason why this like facts and bullshit is like stupid too. Because even Ben Shapiro, even though uh, Seagull Bomb is like honestly is this person's better than Shapiro. I don't know. Even Shapiro, even though he has the like nasally, nasally delivery, it still is on an emotional range, you know? It's, and that's that's the emotional range and that, that gets him excited, right? Which is different than this guy who's just like, I've, I've written this script and I'm now reading it for my YouTube audience and I gotta sound like an academic where I'm boring and very, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, I mean, I don't wanna be giving this person pointers either. <laughs> but like add some emotional range, goddamn. Stimulate me at least a little bit, you know. Excite me. But they are just misinformed on key issues. And if they really understood economics, or if they really understood social policy, or if they really understood X or Y or Z or whatever, then finally they would just come around and understand the truth. I remember back in my teenage boomer con phase. This was okay. This guy had a teenage boomer con face. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I'm... All right. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I mean I... we've all had that. You know, when I was a teenager, I also told kids to get off my lawn and that women shouldn't own property. Now, we have, we've all been through that phase. I get it. And then, I, and then I misled the public to go bomb Iraq. <laughs> I don't like boomers. That's not funny. That's not a funny joke. Well, Cut no. that. Cut that from the <laughs> Well, it's the not, connection between, like, it's not, just, it's not just boomer, right? Like, what you were saying yeah. is a very boomer thing. But he's connecting it with, it, like, it has that, like, neocon. <laughs> I had a Dick Cheney phase. Yeah. Too bad. <laughs> uh, some single moms, I, committed... I got really into Tom Petty at 15. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Not, you know, I endorsed war crimes and then shot my friend in the face. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Very much the mantra that I held. I would debunk libtards because they just didn't understand the oh, laugher sweet. curve well enough. Or one of many other conservative cliches against left wing policies. And as any sort of reasonably educated right-winger on the internet will find out from debating with lefties, there is a seemingly unlimited amount of lefties who have just never heard any counter-arguments to their ideas at all. So it's quite easy to trip them up and just bring up some sort of fact that they may have never experienced before. This is, of course, the famed debunking of libtards. You can... <laughs> That's that's exactly how it works. When I am in an argument and I'm losing, I like to just drop a random bit of information and be like, owned. That's it. Yeah. Boom. They, they do really believe this. Well, like, yeah. I think he's going to, like, back away from this argument, uh, which is, I think, why he's, like, positioning it this way, right? Which is why it's got facts and logic equal cringe. Right. Over. But it is, like, a lot of them do have that idea of just, like, I'll come up with, like, the one thing that I can deliver that'll just, like, point to the worldview being a complete contradiction and their minds would just implode or whatever. And it's, like, I mean, a lot of our, our rationalizations or moral justifications for a position uh, are kind of ad hoc. And so it's, like, you, you can't uh, just drop fact bombs and get us to, like... Because yeah. even... Even if you point us to a contradiction, we're still going to have our feelings. Like, you're going to feel right. in that moment, you're going to be like, yeah, but I still think that's wrong. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, 
you know, it might help later down. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to say here that, like, explaining facts to somebody is going to be the thing. Or, like, it will never be effective in changing people's minds. Or else, like, what the hell am I doing right now, right? Exactly, yeah. But there is a sense in which it's not, it's not, just, it's not just going to be that you drop this fact on them and then all of a sudden uh, you expose their contradiction and their, their brains implode. But it's going to be like... Right. Fight like giving emotionally compelling reasons to why, also why your your position is completely full of shit. You know, no, one hundred percent. I mean, like if I make an argument of, I don't think cops should shoot black people, and you go, you know, some black people commit crime. Yeah, this is this is a fact. It is it is a it is a fact. But like, it's not gonna augment the core belief, right? Or what's what's their argument always? It's like thirteen fifty. Is it not like the statistic that shows that like black people are more likely, or or black on black crime is higher, or something like that? It's they usually have yeah, like a yeah, statistic yeah. that they like plug in, right? Well, it's always like that. Like, well, why do we care about cop shooting black people when we don't care about black people killing black people? It's like, yeah, we can care about both, right? Like, yeah. we, can, <laughs> we can. The the difference is like, cops are sort of institutional. <laughs> The other thing I want to point out too before we move on is he brought up the Laffer curve as something that he used to believe in when he was younger. And that's like absurd. To, like, I can't believe that. I'm like, trying to wrap my brains around that. That's a fact that explodes my brain. So, if you don't know what the Laffer curve is, like, this came from of a dude named Arthur Laffer. I think that was his name, or Archer Laffer. I can't remember. But he came up with this idea, which was that, like, it, it was essentially the, the whole trickle down economics theory that, like, if you, uh, stop taxing people that somehow revenue will increase because like you'll create more jobs and like other stuff and you still have republicans who believe in the laffer curve even though it never works <laughs> no matter how much you untax the rich the wealth of society does not increase it just gets more isolated into pockets of particular rich people which is probably what Laffer wanted to happen in the first place. You can even do this with issues that are less obviously technocratic. I remember also, once upon a time, quoting studies that proved, again with facts and logic, that same-sex marriage would undermine family relations. However, the problem with all this debunking, with all the facts and all of the logic, is that it's all totally missing the point. Are there many libtards on the internet who are very uneducated? Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, I'm waiting to the point we're missing, because I, I heard a couple points in there that also seem to be missing. <laughs> missing. Oh, yeah, like, he, the funny thing is he's <laughs> dropping all these hints that he believes a lot of, like, not cool and not correct uh, view. Like, what did he say there, that somehow, like, gay marriage was going to destroy society? Uh, no, he... he he has studies that demonstrate that gay marriage will harm society. Well, and as we know. look around at well, the world we live in, you know, if you think about it, honestly, though, Trump came after gay marriage. <laughs> I was just going to make that joke. Therefore, therefore, I'm pretty sure. Listen, we're all riding so. with Biden now, though, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, but arguably, none of that had to do with gay marriage, but... Uh... Jesus Christ. And for that matter, there are many conservatards that are also very uneducated oh God, and who you can tense. trip up quite easily, too. The fundamental disagreement between left-wingers and right-wingers on, say, an issue like same-sex marriage is not some sort of technocratic issue of how this will affect the nuclear family more broadly, about how this will affect marriage rates or family formation. And the disagreement is also certainly not based on the utilitarian benefits that one can demonstrate from good family formation. It's not about average rates of poverty or crime or drug use or yeah. any of these things that conservatives will often cite. And perhaps citing all those things can be useful. Sometimes point. they can make people change their minds, I'm sure. However, all that citing those things really matter is if they can get down to the fundamental principles. Because the fundamental principled difference Jesus on an Christ. issue like that is that left-wingers just don't care that much about traditional family structures. So, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We, we agree. 
<laughs> there we go. It took a while, this, but we got there. We I made this comment on our last video when we were like dealing with the trichotomy, which is that, that like this is always the thing that annoys me with neo reactionary content is they take for granted certain things like that, you know, uh, traditional marriage as he's putting it is something that like holds society together and is like this net good or like all the arguments that he's saying here aren't really effective right and he's saying they're not effective because like you know people like us disagree <laughs> that uh, traditional families are important right traditional in his uh, sense of the term and so it's like you no matter like it's one of those things where it's like even if you threw facts and logic at me like in some sense or or like show that like like, I don't, I don't know, just create any statistic that shows, like, a negativity that comes from something. And I could still go, yeah, I would still want the thing provided that negativity. Because at the end of the day, I think it's actually better for society that people get to be with whoever they want. You know? Or, <laughs> you know? And, and that's just, like, going to be a moral argument and usually rest on certain, like not just in intuitions, but like arguments that build up from my intuitions about those moral positions, you know. But they never, the things, they never justify their positions. It's just traditional marriage is good. It is good. It's like, okay, good for you. Yeah. No, it is, it, no. Get out of yeah. my society. <laughs> <laughs> or traditional views of sexual morality. The fundamental question Bone is, how is it good for society to be organized? Not good in a scientific sense. Not good in the sense that can be demonstrated by some social science papers. Here we go. But rather, good in a moral sense. Okay. Good in a sense that simply cannot be demonstrated scientifically. True. What has gotten me thinking about this topic recently is I read through... I will, before he goes on here, I do agree with him on this point, and you're going to get, like, a lot of atheists uh, in the Sam Harris vein that would push back against this, which is that somehow, like, science can figure out morality or science plays some role in morality. And I'm not saying that you need religion or some uh, immaterial or idealistic or something that transcends human beings in a more metaphysical sense uh, to ground morality. I don't think you need that. But I do agree that it's not quite scientific, scientistic. Like it might involve factual things, but it doesn't mean that that's what that is what justifies your your moral positions. I think that comes from right. a different set of reasoning skills. Moral, right? Reasoning. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, no. I, like, if you publish a scientific paper showing that if you murdered every other baby that was born, that would produce a less violent society. That doesn't mean that we should then murder every other child, right? Like, and that, and like, you don't need to be such a follow the cult of scientism right. that hard, right? Right. I mean, but that, like, it gives you what you laid out there is like, you can draw facts from certain things, but that doesn't tell you what the morally right thing is to do, right? right. So it's like all these statistics that he might bring up. This is kind of the point I was making earlier about like gay marriage, right? If it was right. shown that gay marriage leads to some sort of like factual thing, and I perceive that factual thing as negative, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to change my whole worldview because I think my reasoning for wanting gay marriage to happen in the first place has different justification behind it, right? That doesn't. That isn't necessarily going to be like pushed aside easily by your factual information. Right. Although it might be relevant in in my arguments about it. Thomas Carlyle's famous book Chartism oh, Thomas for Carlyle. this channel. I did a live stream discussing it, which I'd suggest checking out. In that book, do he that. deals with this question quite a bit. It's actually really the first thing he deals with is the question of statistics. He is discussing the economic state of England in the 1800s, and his conclusion is that statistics themselves can be of no use whatsoever in determining the fundamental condition of England question. While discussing the inadequacy of statistics, he says, What constitutes the well-being of a man? Many things, of which wages he gets and the bread he buys with them Even are when only he's one quote. preliminary item. How is he related to his employer? By bonds of friendliness? and mutual help, or by hostility and oppression, and chains of... It says opposition, not oppression. <laughs> <laughs> not 
No offense, bud. <laughs> mutual necessity alone. In a word, what degree of contentment can a human creature be supposed to enjoy in that position? With hunger preying on him, his contentment is likely to be small. This is the fundamental problem with statistics and facts and studies, that all of these things cannot ascertain in themselves what is the good life, what is the good way to organize society, sure. what is the good way to organize an economy. Carlyle also discusses the inadequacy of statistics in one other sense. He discusses how it is always possible for there to be one other number missing, one other important fact that, if that fact was included, would change the picture totally. It is impossible to always include all facts in any given analysis, and it's never really possible to know which Jesus ones Christ. are the ones that are really relevant to the question at hand. And this is very true. There's a severe over-reliance on quote-unquote science in modern societies, because even on the issues that... I mean, I feel like we explained this a lot better. And a lot it quicker, really... too. <laughs> explained it really well and really quick. Uh, and I, I imagine a more enjoyable manner. <laughs> a very expressive manner. This, all this dude needs is a couple of lessons in theater or something, you know. Project your voice! <laughs> yeah, do you want, do you want to do yes. that too? <laughs> oh, speaking oh, of which, God. Nick's in the chat. Hello, Nick. How do I, uh, Nick, how do I make you a mod again? Or are you, you are using your moderated account. Okay, cool. Cool. Oh, God, it's another weird behind a historic figure. Yes, yes, it's one of these people could fairly be described as being technocratic. The decisions still need to be made with imperfect data. But that issue with statistics, the issue of the limited knowledge that we can ever have yeah. over any particular issue, is nowhere near as important as the greater issue of statistics just not being particularly relevant to moral questions. Okay. There are really countless examples on this that I could give. I suppose one more good one is the issue of abortion. Left-wingers will often argue that really their policies are what's effective at reducing abortion rates, and they will also mention all of the good benefits that come with legal abortion. False. You know, you know what I argue from? Bodily autonomy. <laughs> 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 Which is a moral position. <laughs> It's not just, like, I do agree there's going to be some people out there that will point to, but usually it's used, usually it's used as a sort of, like, counter-argument, which is, like, uh, which is, like, even if you don't accept my bodily autonomy argument, which most people have, they'll say something like, even if, like, if you don't accept that, at least accept the fact that if you make this thing illegal, more women are going to be harmed because they seek out abortion anyways, etc., etc. Like so, usually they'll make those factual arguments when the repeal to women's bodily autonomy is not met by the person, right? So it's not, it's not like, and there's going to be, I'm, I almost guarantee you there's probably going to be people out there that aren't well versed in certain philosophical discourses or who haven't fully thought out their moral positions and therefore aren't going to make a bodily autonomy argument when they're talking about a woman's right to choose what happens to their body, you know? <laughs> uh, but like that being said, like, of course, some people will engage in arguments beyond that, but that doesn't mean like we don't have other arguments. He's making it sound like all the liberals sit around and they have this one argument for abortion, but they're wrong because statistics are completely irrelevant to anything ever, which I actually think is not the point that we're making because clearly statistics do matter. You know, uh, I like, I, I never know where I want to land in terms of, you know, here's the thing is I wrote my master's thesis on a very moral related subject and I, I kind of am a moral pluralist. And what that means is typically when you talk about moral philosophy, there's three sort of like main schools. There's usually the uh, sort of like virtue theory stuff, which comes out of like Aristotelian ethics. Then there's the kind of like deontological position, which comes out of like a Kantian perspective. And then there's the 
utilitarian, which is like Bentham Mill and all that fun stuff, right? Those are usually like the three predominant sort of like schools of ethics that other schools have sort of like branched out of and whatnot, right? And I'm completely bastardizing it right now. I realize that. But the thing is, so you often get people who are like, I'm a, I'm a utilitarian or I'm a deontologist or I'm a virtue ethicist. And I don't think any of those has like dominion over the other because I, I don't think we have come up in humanity or like human beings studying ethics. I don't think we have come up with a complete, consistent, coherent ethical system. But I think there's some like, I wouldn't call it like truths, but like there's things that I think each position has its own merit in certain circumstances, you know, like. Right, like the categorical imperative. Well, I mean, so if you, I know the categorical imperative is something that annoys you. <laughs> 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 and and like i'll be honest it's my least favorite of the three right but there still is something to just the idea of like having some principles are good you know just knowing that murder is wrong like i don't have to like break out some sort of like ethical calculus when i do that just like don't murder people like it should be that straightforward right yeah but what if they're taking your property <laughs> <laughs> oh god i don't want to get into that fucking debate <laughs> Uh, I, I'm on the big Joel side of that debate for, any, for, for anybody who wants to know. I'm on the big Joel side. Uh, and for those who don't know, uh, remain in your ignorance, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, I so I'm not I'm not a I'm not a deontologist uh, in most cases, but I but I understand where it comes from. I, I do lean more towards a kind of virtue ethics with some uh, utilitarian leanings. But, like, I don't think there is, like, one true sort of ethical uh, position. But, it, like, the point I was getting into it was, like, I, like, I think that, all like, having these perspectives and going through the process and thinking about these things matters. And I also think that, like, statistics do matter. Like, it, it's not like they're completely irrelevant. I think it's important if you were, like... If we do this, this many people survive. And if we do this, that many people die. And, that, and that'll... Our decision or, or like our ability to know that if we do this, that many people die, right? Those are statistics and things that we then could use to then direct our own behaviors in that like most of the time we want fewer people to die, right? <laughs> so it's like, you know, when we're dealing with COVID, right? I think the best strategies to do would be the ones where the fewest amount of people die. Now, of course, you're going to hit some limit where it's like, how draconian in like stopping this thing do we want to be but then you can tell like if the numbers coming out of china are correct they nip this thing in the bud pretty good but they did it by shutting things down but they only shut it down for like a little bit so even though like it was very restrictive and authoritarian in a it was done in a short burst unlike what's happening here which we're having these constant lockdowns opening up and like everything sucks right <laughs> Jody, look, I can highlight my message. Good for you, Nick. <laughs> uh, so, like, my point is, is, like, we still want the information to shape how we do things. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to give us insight in what the absolute correct moral position is, but it should guide our moral thinking in certain ways, right? Like, I'm not going to sit here and say statistics are always irrelevant, we're so far past the idea of lockdown, people aren't going to follow it much longer. Yeah, I know, Jesus. Oh my God! Now I'm now I'm reminded about COVID. <laughs> Moving on. From reducing crime rates and getting rid of people who would be a drain on the system. However, all of that people is people are a drain the on point. the system. None Eee. of that data is really relevant to the question at all, because the fundamental question is, what is the value of human life? Whether or not human life has any inherent dignity or value is not a question which can be determined by a study or a statistic. This whole mantra of quote-unquote facts and logic is intimately connected with the left-wing catchphrase of quote-unquote science. The is that, oh, hold on, is that a left-wing catchphrase of we need to scientifically deduce the value of human beings? That doesn't really fit on a catchy slogan for us, I don't know. The, the catchphrase itself was just science because <laughs> because left wing, left do, wing yeah. people just walk around going science <laughs> <laughs> when i go to the lab that's what i do i just i walk up to colleagues and go science and they go science 
When, that's, when, that's how the conversations go. When my anti-fascist comrades are running in the streets, fighting Proud Boys, they're like, science! <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> I feel like he said something there uh, two seconds ago. I got distracted by the science quote. There was something else you, stupid he said. What he is the value of human life? Oh, okay. Not human life has no, but because like, again, he he's. I keep waiting for him to get to the fucking point, which is like, okay, so now you're it talking takes a about while. life having an inherent value. What does that mean? Where does it get its inherent? Like. I kind of like know because I listen to a bunch of this shit. I kind of feel like I know where he's going. But like, why doesn't he get to that point? Where does this inherent value come from that you think that human beings have such that abortion would be wrong? You know? And it's almost like I feel. And this is the same thing with the trichotomy bullshit. Underlying all of this is Catholicism, but they never just come out and be like, I'm a Catholic no. and I believe it just because. Like, yeah. <laughs> if they just fucking said that, I would be like, okay, cool. You're a Catholic who wants to go back to feudalism. I get it. Why don't you God just like, get it? <laughs> why don't you just constantly like frame all your discussions that way and go, look, I like feudalism. And then we'd be like, okay, we know where you're at. Cool. The left, famously uncritical of science. <laughs> Gotta hit that 10 minute marker. Jesus any inherent dignity or value is not a question which can be determined by a study or a statistic. This whole mantra of quote-unquote facts and logic is intimately connected with the left-wing catchphrase of quote-unquote science. science. The false left-wing <laughs> idea of science is something which we have gotten a great deal of opportunities to see in the last year, especially with the current world crisis. Left-wingers repeatedly assure us that we should just follow the science, follow the science, as if that means much of anything. As Carlyle pointed out, I'm sure that I could point to many different inadequacies with how the current world crisis has been measured. But again, that does not get to the real problem. The problem that there's no such thing as a scientific answer to what the best government policy is on any topic. Yeah. It may be a cliche at this point, but as I'm sure we have heard before, you could s prevent many lives from being lost by just oh, banning no, all add. automobiles. I'm down with that. Yeah, go for it. I'm not. I'm not necessarily opposed. I wouldn't like it, but I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea of banning all automobiles. I I would be okay. Well, I'd be okay with. Uh, forcibly reducing the number of automobiles for a variety of reasons actually they always make this argument but like i, I don't think it does what they think it does <laughs> like transport like transportation has benefits right i like i do agree with what he's saying because it's the same thing that i said before which is like how we lock down is going to be dependent on our ethics, our moral position, what we what we want out of our political institutions, right? But <laughs> implicit in that is a desire to want to deal with the pandemic. I think most, I mean, like, you'll notice that most of the conservative people are the ones who are just like, fuck it, let this thing rampage and kill everyone. <laughs> right. You know, at least, like, we're in the realm of going, okay, we believe it exists. Now let's find yeah. a way to, like, deal with <laughs> yeah. this thing, you know? Oh, that's the thing, right? Is this whole, like, well, you can't trust science to determine the value of a human life. Okay, but we can use science to determine this thing kills people. Like, can we at least agree on that? And science, can again, we, science is going to inform what you do, you know? Yeah. Because, like, it's Such going... as <laughs> this listen. disease kills people. Yeah. We should... And the moral part of that is we should probably do something about that then. Well, like, it, again, these people argue for uh, patriarchy and traditionalism and all this stuff. So it's like they want the state to impose, like, traditional family norms on people. Now, I haven't heard him, and maybe we're going to get to it, but I haven't heard him sort of, like, speculate about the effectiveness or masks or whatnot. But there are a lot of conservatives out there who complain on and on, about, and libertarians that complain about mask wearing and all this fun stuff. And I realize that uh, neo-reactionaries are not leo libertarians, right? But there, there can be overlaps in all these like right-wing positions, right? 
but still, it's like I, I've I've yet there's very few I think left wing people that I've seen actually deny the data on this virus. It's usually, <laughs> I mean, if they're going to uh, d- like even even the people that I remember like before who got sort of, and I've speculated, I'm sort of all over the place with this point, but I've speculated on this before, which is that there were certain people who were sort of lumped in by like skeptic communities as being more left wing, who believed in kind of like crunchy environmentalist stuff that it isn't real, like being completely anti GMO. When, when you fully understand the science behind genetically modified foods, they're not like inherently worse for you or some, they don't like contain magical properties. Right. But this was perceived as being like a left wing position because I guess most right wingers were not pro environment. And this seemed like a pro environment like movement. Right. But really it was like a libertarian sort of position and all these like Instagram influencers, right. Their main argument was like sticking foreign substances, like within yourself. And and you'll notice like this gets to a lot of like purity shit with like fascism, right. The idea that like you're polluting your body by ingesting like evil foods or like bad foods. And like part of that is like, that's why Hitler was like vegetarian, right? Like there was elements of that. I'm not saying I'm, I am also, well, I'm a pescatarian now, but I was vegan for 10 years. So I, and I did so for non pure, like purity based reasons. But like my main contention with a lot of vegans was that their reasons for being vegan were not like, not always the like ethical reasons or the, uh, environmental reasons, but all had to do with like this sense of like purity that like I'm I'm eating my juice cleanses and that somehow is gonna like cleanse me, <laughs> remove the magical toxins from me, right? And like people in the skeptic community perceived these people as left wing, but they were all the people who jumped ship and became Trump supporters, became QAnon believers. Like, go on Instagram. The same people who are talking about chakras don't believe this virus exists, support Donald Trump, and f- worship QAnon. So it's like, were they left-wing? Yeah. I don't know. If I was still in academia and doing psychological work, I might have investigated that question. Because <laughs> it doesn't. I don't see a lot of people talking about it. The idea that governance is a science and that the right experts just need to be put in charge is an idea that has been at the heart of modern progressivism. Simultaneously, progressives have demanded the increasing democratization, quote unquote, of society, while also demanding that power be increasingly placed in the hands of experts who are anything but democratic. But okay, I did start off this video by- Is he trying to say there's like a contradiction? Like, I guess he's saying that, like, people on our side both want things to be more democratic, but then also want a technocracy? Because I don't think that's true. <laughs> I I don't know what... I mean, I, this sounds like more of the sort of conservative, don't listen to the experts. You can be an expert. Just democratize your opinions. No, granted, like, I think there's something wrong... Don't grant that. No, don't no, give him I'm... that. I respect experts. I just don't think that... I think the problem is when you have a society that's completely turned into sort of like an Ayn Randian technocratic society run by like Elon Musk people, right? Which I think is like what most people envision when they say that, right? And the thing is like... This isn't this isn't a negative against uh, expertise, but like a lot of experts will disagree, and so there needs to be room. Like you don't want like an expert dictatorship, whatever the fuck that would be, right? But you would want some like even democratic procedures within these organizations to allow, I think, for better decision making, right? When you have like expert consensus, right? It, it shouldn't just re- rely on a single expert or something like this, right? That's sure. I no, I, I agree with that. Like, you don't, you don't want this like philosopher king who got famous for you know stealing, you know, silicon from Brazil and then made a car, <laughs> um, to somehow think that they can run a government, right? You don't want that. But there's That's also again nothing Bolivia. wrong with like <laughs> there's nothing wrong with like a specific turning to an expert on a specific issue. Like I don't know a global pandemic ravaging your country and killing its people. Maybe you should turn to 
the world leading immunologist about this. I don't know. I think that's okay to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, like, there's, he hasn't outright said it, but like, there's an element here which it sounds like he's saying, like, all oh, these experts want to tell us what to do. But it's like, a lot of these experts, when it comes to, like, policy, they're not dictating policy. Like, what Dr. Fauci was doing in the States, for example, even when Trump was in charge, was basically going, based on the evidence that we have and the scientists that we communicate with, here's a bunch of things that you can do, some possibilities. And, like, what they did was, you know, Trump would make a decision and then they would say, like, how people should behave given what Trump did, right? Like, because, like, for them, it was just, like, they know it's not their place to actually make the decision, but they're, like, there with the expertise to, like, help fill things in, right? And give you options. It's just sad that at the beginning of this thing, we had uh, Cheeto in charge. <laughs> Cheeto. <laughs> I was going to use another, like... Uh, I don't think of it as ableist, but like, you know, more demeaning language. Talking about Ben Shapiro, is it even really fair to lay any of this blame at his feet? In one sense, it may seem quite unfair. He has, in fact, of course, spoken out many times against at least some of the things that I've talked about here. And I don't mean the policies. I mean these very left-wing mantras that I am alleging are a result of the facts and logic mentality. He has certainly spoken out against the idea that society should be run by quote-unquote science or experts. I certainly do not think Ben Shapiro represents anything that can authentically be called conservatism. He even sometimes refers to himself as a libertarian. But just because I don't think he's really conservative does not mean that it's fair to say that he represents all of the left in its mainstream form, but... He's calling Ben Shapiro a lefty. Or at least, like, liberal? The fuck is going on here? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say I know. Jesus Christ. I mean, their whole uh, sense of political spectrums are so messed up. Like, even Vienna in the chat here was saying, like, Liberalism and technocracy have a lot of overlap, so I guess when you think liberalism is left-wing, you get this take. Yeah, I mean, like, there's so much blending going on here with, like, political ideologies that it's, it's hard to, like, pin these guys and what they're saying. But I guess for them, right, like, anything outside of this, like, worldview where, like, you have tradition and uh, ethno-nationalism and all the, uh, the dictator daddy figure, anything outside of that is left-wing, you know? Maybe like on the triangle, everything <laughs> goes to the, the left point. The issue that I'm trying to point out here is not that Ben Shapiro agrees with the left on everything. That is certainly not the case. What I am trying to point out here are the consequences of his ideas, and more importantly, the consequences of his aesthetic. He may very well condemn some of the conclusions of the left, but it is his very own aesthetic and the aesthetic of many so-called conservatives that have come before him that help fuel the conclusions that the left have come to. Thanks for watching. What? Donate to my subscription what channel. the <laughs> literal <laughs> fuck has just happened? Why do you have a Patreon? Why do you have patrons for that? What? How did we get here? It was a leftist aesthetic? All because he says How facts did we get here? How did he make it here? Just There's like the no conclusion point. of this video, right? Is that Ben Shapiro makes leftist arguments. Well, he doesn't make leftist arguments. He uses the aesthetic of leftism. He uses the aesthetic of leftism. By using facts and logic. Or like having that as his like debate persona. Ben Shapiro is like a leftist is, is the conclusion of this. Sort of. That's the entire conclusion. Don't sort of me. But that like, is the gotta, conclusion that you have again, to come to. It, like, they, they never, like, explain, like, why this matters. Right? Like, so, like, a good way... Listen, I've graded a lot of papers in my life. <laughs> uh, now we a get good, what this is about. A good way go. to go in essay structure would be, like, here's 
here's the thing that I talked about. Look, as Ben Shapiro represents a left aesthetic. Cool. Like maybe maybe that's true. Like maybe I could maybe agree there was parts of that in here leading to that sort of position. But now that you got to that position, like look, I made these comparisons. Ben Shapiro has this left aesthetic. Then the final conclusion needs to be, why does this matter? <laughs> <laughs> well like is it bad that he has a left aesthetic and then the question is why is that bad you, you know what i mean and like lead to some yeah. sort of conclusion such that i can go oh you made an argument because really this is like this is just him saying there's this thing called facts and logic <laughs> it's the lefties that tend to use this thing ben shapiro has that aesthetic yeah cool <laughs> <laughs> what a dumb fucking video 3,000 people have watched this <laughs> Jesus oh, I try to get dumb out of my vocabulary but sometimes the, same with crazy both of those words these people just drive it out of me so I apologize to anyone that bugs oh my god well we're at 1.30, or like an hour 30. I was thinking the next thing we could do is do some uh, do some impeachment stuff. But at the same time, I don't even know what the hell uh, the hell happened today. I didn't know if there would like be any like clips, like someone would like summarize. Because there was some of that yesterday. I don't know if you watched any of the impeachment stuff yesterday. No, I've tried to just say, you know, this this man isn't my president anymore. <laughs> therefore, I can just space the hell out of whatever whatever the hell he's doing with his life. And I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I mean, there was like some uh there was some wonder mo wonderful moments yesterday cuz I guess uh Trump's lawyers clearly are phoning it in. <laughs> I heard about that. That was fucking hilarious. Yeah. And uh, one, of, one of the lawyers is like, I'm I'm a country town lawyer. <laughs> I'm now, I'm, Your Honor, I ain't no big city lawyer, but. It's like, uh, it's like, you know, senators are a long tradition. Every, everybody's like, I'm the senator from Delaware, or I'm the senator from over here. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? So there was, there was some of that yesterday that was fun. Uh, the only thing else I remember from yesterday as well was they had the uh, Senator Rankin gave a pretty like heartbreaking speech because I guess his uh, I guess his daughter was with him uh, the day the attack took place. Okay. And he's the one who's like leading, I guess, in charge of the uh, the Democrats like impeachment argument. I don't know what the hell to call it. And uh, hmm. there's like a name for it. He's like the lead person on like presenting the the articles of impeachment to uh, the senators. The other thing, like they showed, it was like the, this, and there was some more video that came out today. I guess like so they showed a clip yeah yesterday that was like 15 minutes that like really sort of like broke down the timeline that was like really uh, well put together. And I'm not going to play here because it's like 15 minutes long or whatever, but like I recommend that everyone go watch it. I think it's a really nice, concise way of, especially like for people who are kind of like, well, did he really incite violence? Like, is was it a really like incitement? Like, I don't know. And just show them this 15 minute clip because it does a really good job to contrast of like when people started showing up at the Capitol, when he started to talk, the kinds of things that he said during his talk. It interspliced, like, like interconnected with video clips of the people actually, like, harming police, gouging police, uh, uh, like, their eyeballs out and bludgeoning uh, other police officers uh, with flags and fire extinguishers and stuff like this. And really showing that, like, and, and, and even, like, it was amazing to me how like close some of these people actually got to getting to senators like one of the clip they released today which was not included in this 15 minute video was security footage that showed that like you you know the one clip of the the one uh police officer's name was uh, good eugene goodman i think and there's the video of him walking up the stairs and then he looks over at the senate chamber realizes that it's open 
and then pushes the dude and walks him in a different direction and then the crowd sort of followed them so he basically directed the violent mob away from the senate floor uh and Hmm. you know who knows if they actually went the other direction and they got their hands on mike pence or whoever like we could be having a different conversation today right but like moments before that incident occurred you see him run past uh mitt romney and mitt romney seems to be like oh what is up young man <laughs> and eugene is just like get the fuck out of here <laughs> and then you see mitt romney like take off. <laughs> uh and so like they have like security footage of like all this stuff and then there's like the the calls of the police officers and here's the thing is you know we're a cab here we're, we're not supportive of police generally, but that doesn't mean that you can't, like, uh, like sympathize with human beings who all of a sudden this deadly mob is coming towards them to kill them, you know? And uh, you can hear that in the calls to uh, calls to the higher-up to be like, where's the backup? We need help. We need help. Uh, so I think they're doing a good, a good attempt at, at making their case uh, for yeah. what happened there. But I was hoping for for highlight real shit. Oh, here we go. Highlights. Cabal siege. Uh, Eighteen minutes ago. Okay, maybe we'll we'll briefly watch some of this, and skip through it when it's boring. Can you see it on the the Discord? Yep. Yep. Got it. Okay, cool. When you think of a degree, think Conestoga. Choose an accredited degree Conch- program focused Kessel on your future career. Think small classes with industry. Yeah. The evidence will show uh, you everyone, here, let me try to pause that ex-president well, Trump was no innocent bystander. So the evidence Kevles. will show that he clearly incited... My computer is breaking down. <laughs> there we go. Uh, everyone go check out uh, Clara. Follow Clara if you haven't already. They're Kevils, basically. Uh, she's awesome. And she mostly does gaming streaming, but she also does some more uh, left-wing content. So she's really cool. Go check her out. This quality, what the heck? What quality? I don't, here's here's the thing, Kevils. <laughs> I don't even know. We made it to affiliate status, and I accepted the thing that says I'm now an affiliate. But, <laughs> but you keep giving me bits. I don't know what bits are. <laughs> I don't know what you just did. You've done something, and it has showed up on my thing saying that you gave me something. Don't know what it means. So... <laughs> And I know, I know I can make emotes now, but I, I basically, I think I'm going to take all day tomorrow and sit down and figure out what the hell it means uh, to be an affiliate. One bit equals one U.S. Like one U.S. citizen? Do I get a person? <laughs> I get one U.S. I'm guessing you, you mean one American dollar. Well, that's cool. I don't even know, like, do you, do you cash the bits? I have no fucking clue. Uh... I don't know what this stuff is. Yes, one cat boy. That's the other thing. Follow Cat Boy Rancher on Twitter. <laughs> that's uh, that's Claire as well. We're what we're doing right now, Claire, is we're watching the, uh, we're watching highlights from today's impeachment stuff. We just started, so we're gonna check that out. The January sixth insurrection. It will show that Donald Trump surrendered his role as commander-in-chief and became the inciter-in-chief oh, of a snap. dangerous insurrection. <laughs> and this was, as one of our colleagues put it so cogently on January 6th itself, the greatest betrayal of the presidential oath in the history of the United States. This is, like, that's... The evidence will show you... Not that we have to go into too much detail there, but that's, like, one thing that annoys me about the trials is the, like pomp and circumstance or like the way like yeah for them to be like it's the greatest betrayal and it's like i don't know nixon's watergates like they're not like on par but like it was still pretty bad (laughs) or or like reagan's iran contra like presidents before have done also really terrible shit not like not to say what happened on january 6th wasn't terrible it was but like you know (laughs) I can't oh, yeah, stay yeah. because my phone is poop. I'm over at uh, Alex's. Hope you have a good stream, though. Thank you. Uh, enjoy your time with Alex. Say hi to Alex for me and uh, have fun, Claire. Sad thing is, people will forget. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the whole the good thing about like this record, Nick, is that I don't know. I, I I thought the videos that they released that got shared on like basically all the mainstream news sources, except maybe Fox. I don't know. But uh, I think they were quite compelling. And you know, if you do that, I think that's one of the reasons why they did that during this trial was because they don't want people to forget, and it's a way of sort of like uh, reminding people what happened. You were gonna say something a couple seconds ago there, Elmo. No, no. Sorry. I wanted to say goodbye to my friend. <laughs> People won't forget Trump, though. He's been memed into the history. Yeah, I mean, not only has he been memed into the history books, like, I like, you don't, you, like, I, I, I don't want to, like, be too hyperbolic here, but there were, like, tons of people who I think were traumatized by a lot of the shit that he did. So, like, that, that leaves a mark. Like, I, and, like, I feel there's, like, a sense in which the mere, like, even the, the psychic trauma that he created that is different than the other presidents, right? So even though, like, Ronald Reagan and, like, George like George Bush, I think, did, like, way more harm to the world generally, right? But, like, the psychic trauma that was created to uh, many people within America by the shit that he... Like, keeping them constantly on edge with his tweets and all this, right? I think it, it leaves a lasting impact in ways that I don't think George Bush did, right? Even though he should have. Arguably, he should have, right? But it, it, it's... It's different when it's felt more personally, I think. That he saw it coming and was not remotely surprised by the violence. And when the violence inexorably and inevitably came as predicted and overran this body, in the House of Representatives with chaos, we will show you that he completely abdicated his duty as commander in chief to stop the violence and protect the government and protect our officers and protect our people. He violated his oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, the government, and the people of the United States. The evidence will show you that he assembled, inflamed, and incited his followers to descend upon the Capitol to stop the steal, to block Vice President Pence and Congress from finalizing his opponent's election victory over him. We will show that he had been warned that these followers were prepared for a violent attack, targeting us at the Capitol through media reports, law enforcement reports, and even arrests. In short, we will prove that the impeached president was no innocent bystander whose conduct was totally appropriate and should be a standard for future presidents but that he incited this attack, and he saw it coming. Donald Trump committed a- I mean, that's, that's the case they have to make, right? That it wasn't just, it wasn't like these people just spontaneously did this, but that it was like, due to his incitement of them is why this happened, right? right? Exactly. And I think like, I will say like, they're, I mean, again, not to say that I like like liberal Dems, right? But you could tell like the difference in caliber in, in a, in the creation of rhetorical arguments. <laughs> like, this is way better than, like, <laughs> some of the QAnon people on the, the right wing, right? Just, I'm going to lay out my case. He's going to use facts and logic. <laughs> A massive crime against our Constitution and our people and the worst violation of the presidential oath of office in the history of the United States of America. For this, he was impeached by the House of Representatives, and he must be convicted by the United States Senate. If anyone ever had a doubt as to his focus that day, it was not to defend us, it was not to console us, it was to praise and sympathize and commiserate with the rampaging mob. It was to continue to act as inciter-in-chief, not commander-in-chief, by telling the mob that their election had been stolen from them. Even then, after that vicious attack, he continued to spread the big lie. And as everyone here knows, Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes and 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. But Donald Trump refused to accept his loss even after this attack. And he celebrated the people who violently interfered with the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in American history and did that at his urging. And when he did, in this video, finally tell them to go home in peace, he added this message. (laughs) 
<laughs> Jesus Christ. That face. We they didn't even bother face. trying to get a better picture. Oh my god. Well, I mean that's that's the, the image of him making this statement because he sent this on a, a video tweet or whatever. Uh I could have waited till he closed his mouth to screen cap it. <laughs> we love you. Know? you. You're very special. I <laughs> I was going to say, uh, uh, Jeremy Rankin or Raskin, whatever his name is, uh, great public, uh, like, uh, just even, like, skills of, like, being able to, like, glance down and then look back up and, like, regurgitate what he looked at. Like, great rhetorical skills. I wish I had that ability. <laughs> uh, but also, I'm fascinated. Listen, and I mean this completely as, like, a fellow a bald human who has absolutely no hair. But I am fascinated by his bald spot because it he somehow still maintains the front. Like, mine is, like, gone completely. Like, I've got nothing. But he's got, like, it's just maintained on, like, the back, the back end. And I'm very perplexed by it. I mean, because then you could just, like, I don't know, constantly lean back and appear to have hair. I do not have that ability. <laughs> I, I will say, because I, I, I know a lot of people get touchy with, like, baldness or whatever. I really don't care that I'm bald. I've been balding since I've been fucking 20. So <laughs> I just find it amusing at this point. We love you. You're very special. We love you. You're very special. Distinguished members of the Senate, this is a day that will live in disgrace in American history. That is, unless you ask Donald Trump. Because this is what he tweeted before he went to bed that night at 6.01 p.m. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and peace. And in peace. Remember this day forever. I mean, like, you can see, like, the argument they're making here is because, like, he sent that video telling them, like, we love you, you're special, and here is, like, you know, we'll remember this forever. Like, it's showing that, like, he's not angry that they did what they did, you know? Which kind of lends to the idea yeah. that he incited it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, he not even really, uh, he incited it. Yeah. He did that. <laughs> that is a thing he did. I don't know why we have to debate it in court, but it is a thing that happened. Well, I mean, like, they, they have to make the argument, though. That's the whole point of doing the... the... <laughs> This is what the show is being put on for, because like, as sad as it is, not everyone. You would think that everyone would know. Not everyone knows, right? There's gonna be that old, uh, uh, you know, what was that dude, Ken Bone, who just could never decide who to vote for. <laughs> I've heard everyone's position, but I'm just still undecided. <laughs> this is this is for him. <laughs> Not consoling the nation, not reassuring, every, reassuring everyone that the government was secure, not a single word that entire day condemning the violent insurrection. That's what he says. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election See, victory long, so is so unceremoniously <laughs> and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember Go this home. day forever. This was all perfectly natural and foreseeable to Donald Trump. At the beginning of the day, he told you it was coming. At the end of the day, he basically says, I told you this would happen. And then he adds, remember this day forever, but not as a day of disgrace, a day of horror and trauma, as the rest of us remember it, but as a day of celebration, a day of commemoration. And if we let it be, it will be a day of continuation a call to action, and a rallying cry for the next rounds of insurrectionary justice, because all of this was totally appropriate. Senators, the stakes of this trial could not be more serious. One of our Capitol officers who defended us that day was a longtime veteran of our force, a brave and honorable public servant who spent several hours battling the mob as part of one of those blue lines defending the Capitol 
in our. I thought it was gonna be like one of those one of those brave people who's been on the force for only hours. <laughs> it, was like, oh my God. it was like the way he was wording that. I was like, where are you going with this? It's getting close. Yeah, getting close, man. Now again, I don't like the flowery language about the police, but he's not just appealing to people like me. So. Other people will get freaked out about that. Where I'm like, what do you, what do you want this, this, <laughs> this democratic representative in a country that primarily supports police to get up there and be like, fuck the police, and then like flip the pedestal. <laughs> He's trying to appeal to these Republicans who are sitting there going, blue lives matter, but bludgeoning them with fire extinguishers to execute Mike Pence. That's cool. <laughs> and gouging, like in gouging. I don't know if you know if you knew this. One of them, uh, one of the police officers, might lose their sight because the protesters gouged his eyes out. No, I didn't know that. Jesus Christ. Yeah, like not out, but like gouged his eyes, like you know, thumbs in the socket kind of thing. So uh, you know, pleasant people. Democracy. For several hours straight as the marauders punched and kicked and mauled and spit upon and hit officers with baseball bats and fire extinguishers, cursed the cops and stormed our capital, he defended us and he lived every minute of his oath of office. And afterwards, overwhelmed by emotion, he broke down in the rotunda. And he cried for 15 minutes. And he shouted out, I got called an N-word 15 times today. And then he recorded, I sat down with one of my buddies, another black guy in tears just started streaming down my face. And I said, what the F, man? Is this America? That's the question before all of you in this trial. Is he also went on to say, if you finish the rest of this quote, what the fuck just happened? I'm so sick and tired of this shit. Yep. That's the question before all of you in this trial. Is this America? Oh, I'm Jean Nicolas, the UN They end up playing, uh, <laughs> this is America. <laughs> that would have been a, the way cooler transition. That would have been incredible. <laughs> YouTube, you need to get on that. You need to get on these transitions. Do better. Or not just the transition. Imagine they... Just like, <laughs> so he's like... And then he said, and that's the question in front of us. Is this America? And that question was answered several years ago by Childish Gambino. In this... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is, God. in fact, America. <laughs> as, child... as Danny Glover, A.K. Childish Gambino. <laughs> is this America? And you'll see that this violent attack was not planned in secret. The insurgents believed that they were doing the duty of their president. They were following his orders. And so they publicized it openly, loudly, proudly exact blueprints of how the attack would be made. Law enforcement saw these postings and reported that these insurgents would violently attack the Capitol itself. This was not just a, com a comment by an official to fight for a cause. This was months of cultivating a base of people who were violent, praising that violence and then leading that violence that rage straight at our door. The point is this. I don't even know who this By the time is. he called the cavalry of his thousands of supporters on January 6th, and an event he had invited them to, he had every reason to know that they were armed, that they were violent, and that they would actually fight. He knew who he was calling, and the violence they were capable of. And he still gave that marching orders to go to the Capitol and quote, fight like hell and stop the steal. Make no mistake, 
The violence was not just foreseeable to President Trump. The violence was what he deliberately encouraged. I will say, though, too, when she said uh, that they, they made it like very visible, and it reminded me the day of, because like, I watched a lot of the, uh, or not a lot, but I was watching somebody's live stream. When, and I've, you know, I've already said this on the stream, but I have more people watching now. <laughs> but when, when this happened, uh, the day of, I was watching a live stream by one of the MAGA people who had entered the building, and there was a moment that just like blew me away for like the surrealness of it, to, like the surreal quality of it. And it was a moment when he realized that like twenty thousand people were watching him, and he was basically, he goes twenty thousand people in the chat, let's go. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> and it <laughs> and it was like that moment of just like you know modern day stream culture live streaming a coup attempt that just like it took me out of it for a few seconds and I was just like what the fuck is happening? Right now? <laughs> you know. I would have never I mean like there's a, a sense in which like of course I would have expected it cuz like you know Americans will turn cooing into a branding experience but <laughs> Because, of course, they would. But uh, at the same time, I was, like, in shock of just, like, growing up, I never would have thought that there was going to be live streams of capital insurrections. By the way, smash that follow. <laughs> Hit the like button. Subscribe. President Trump was given every opportunity to tell his supporters, yes, if I lose, yes. I will peacefully <laughs> transfer power to the next president. Instead... Everyone has to watch Toast of London, by the way, so the they get that The only gym. way he could lose the election is if it was stolen. In tweet after tweet, he made sweeping allegations about election fraud that couldn't possibly be true. But that was the point. He didn't care if the claims were true. He wanted to make sure that his supporters were angry, like the election was being ripped away from them. On May 24th, six months before the election, he tweeted, it will be the greatest no. rigged election in history. How could he possibly know it would be the greatest rigged election in history six months before the election happened? And on June 22nd, more of the same, rigged 2020 election, it will be the scandal of our times. Again, about an election that had not even happened. Now, all of us in this room have run for election, and it's no fun to lose. I'm a Texas Democrat. We've lost a few elections over the years. <laughs> like, her, 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 her. All the old, <laughs> old people in the room. At least he's playing to the, the crowd in front of him. <laughs> but can you imagine telling your supporters that the only way you could possibly lose is if an American election was rigged and stolen from you. And ask yourself whether you've ever seen anyone at any level of government make the same claim about their own election. In Michigan, you'll recall that President Trump was attacking that state and its officials. He continued these attacks even after Michigan certified its votes. Take a look at Michigan. Take a look at what they did with respect to counties. And then you get to Detroit, and it's like more votes than people? Dead people voting all over the place? You know, I went almost... <laughs> Dead people voting all over the place? <laughs> happened they rose up and they started voting i do <laughs> it, there's there's like a surreal quality to this too because it's like it's not like trump is dead but there's a feeling that like <laughs> you know what i mean like he's dead because he's so out of the spotlight right now doesn't it Twitter? Yeah. no one's really airing him like right now saying anything and so there's like this weird like out of body quality here where it's like we're watching videos of a bygone era, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> the best part about the impeachment is Trump has to watch all his tweets displayed, knowing he can never tweet again. <laughs> oh, 
if he's watching well like my guess is he's probably watching of course he is right but yeah the fact that he can't like live tweet uh what's happening at his impeachment is fantastic every county in michigan almost every district we should have won that state very easily we have a similar type of governor i think but i'll let you know that in about a week He's literally telling them Brian, that no, there no, were no. more votes in Detroit than people. You will see. <laughs> I realize that this is uh, an issue with global news and how they specifically cut that. <laughs> but it comes across as just like, I'm just going to state this obvious fucking fact <laughs> and how stupid he sounds. <laughs> and, I, and I don't need to back it up. He literally thought more people voted than were people in the <laughs> In the city of Detroit. He's going to be on his burner account called Not Trump. <laughs> totally not Trump. Or what was, uh, remember when he pretended to be the person uh, who, like, he called, uh, he called, like, a bunch of reporters. Oh, fuck. There was a thing where he tried to pretend to, to be someone. Oh, it was Baron? I think it was Baron. Because th then it was, like, funny because it turned out, like, that's what he named his uh, son after. Yeah, Baron, let me see your phone for a minute. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he pretended it was John Barron. It was something like that. He pretended to be this person and would be like, Trump's awesome. Like, Trump's great. It's like you can tell that it's actually Trump pretending to be this person. <laughs> and in the months as the president made these statements, people listened. Armed supporters surrounded election officials' homes. The Secretary of State for Georgia got death threats. Officials warned the president that his rhetoric was dangerous and it was going to result in deadly violence. And that's what makes this so different because when he saw firsthand the violence that his conduct was creating, he didn't stop it. He didn't condemn the violence. He incited it further, and he got more specific. He didn't just tell them to fight like hell. He told them how, where, and when. This isn't just God supply. Damn commercials. So I looked it up. It, was, uh, it wasn't John Barron. It was John Miller was the pretend, uh, pretend Trump. So I don't know where I got that factoid about uh, his son and it being his son. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was John Miller. These defendants oh, themselves have told you exactly why they were here. So we got, in time we got Watkins. We plan on going to D.C. on the 6th, weather permitting. Because, <laughs> you know, weather permitting is when we're going to do the coup. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You got you to gotta make sure it's sunny out. Crowl. What a weird name. No. What's going on on, on the 6th? Watkins. D.C. Trump wants all body patriots to come. Here we got Bruno Cua. President Trump is calling us to fight, and this isn't a joke. This is where and when we make our stand. January 6th, Washington, D.C. Jenna Ryan. I thought I was following my president. I thought I was following what we were called to do. He asked us to fly there. He asked us to be there. So I was doing what he asked us to do. <laughs> that is, you know, <laughs> that is pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, it's honest. Super honest. Our president wants us here. We wait and take orders from our president. That as well. These are apparently people who uh, were at the siege. You'll see this in the trial. That in the halls of the Capitol, on social media, in news interviews, and in charging documents, they confirm they were following the president's orders. You can see some of the statements on that screen. One who said, Trump wants all able-bodied patriots. Another, that President Trump is calling us to fight. This isn't a joke. Another one, I thought I was following my president. I thought I was following what we were called to do. Our president wants us here. We wait and take orders from the president. He made them believe over many weeks that the election was stolen and they were following his command to take back their country. At 12 so uh, I, have, I was informed by Siegelbaum, and I did uh, double check it. He did use a John Barron. So it says Trump used the pseudonym John Barron, sometimes John Barron, throughout the 1980s 
with its earliest known usage in 1980 and its last acknowledgement in 1990. <laughs> According to the Washington Post, the name was a go-to alias when Trump was under scrutiny, in need of a tough front man, or otherwise wanting to convey a message without attaching his own name to it. Barron would be introduced as a spokesperson for Trump. <laughs> And a little weird that he ended up naming his son Baron. Interesting. Oh, 53, as the president's speech was playing on cell phone broadcasts, the outermost barricade of the northwest side of the Capitol was breached. And Capitol Police were forced back to the steps of the Capitol. And at 2.30, I heard that terrifying banging on house chamber doors. For the first time in more than 200 years, the seat of our government was ransacked on our watch. Someone shouted up to us, duck, then lie down, then ready your gas masks. Shortly after, there was a terrifying banging on the chamber doors. I will never forget that sound. Shouts and panicked calls to my husband and to my sons. Now, while this was going on... And I will say, like, it, it, even when, like, all those, like, right-wingers were being belligerent to AOC recently, like, this is why, like, that's... It, it's clear, like, what, what that woman went through was traumatizing. Like, not just yeah. AOC, like, this person here. Just for the simple fact of, like, even... Even if you can look in retrospect and say none of them died. I mean, like, still you have to get through the fact that, like, police officers were bludgeoned to death on, like, these people. And they, and they marched and trampled over their own. Some woman who was flying a Don't Tread on Me uh, flag got trampled to death. Uh, they went through all this to get in. You don't think that they were going to harm these people? Did They didn't have the intent to harm these people? And it's like, even... even in their shoes when they didn't know this all of a sudden there's this mob outside bashing on the doors breaking the windows trying to get into them and thinking what do they do if they get in it's traumatizing and it, even if you could sit here and go like fuck the democrats you know and like i agree like they don't i'm i'm a lefty like i don't share a lot of these people's politics but i could still empathize with the fact of like a mob was coming after them you know so you get a lot of these people who want to sit here and say, like, why are they doing this and not, like, doing COVID stuff? Well, it turns out that they're doing both at the same time. So at least, and, like, we can argue about whether or not the COVID stuff is going far enough or whatever and all about the 2,000 turns into 1,400 checks and all that bullshit. And uh, congratulations, by the way, on your $1,400 checks that are coming soon. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Glad um, to get something. <laughs> But yeah, like, you you know, we can quibble about that stuff. But like, I think this this thing is important. It's important to acknowledge that these people were traumatized as just like human beings in the same way that we acknowledge like what the Parkland uh, victims went through and stuff like this, you know. Especially since this was orchestrated by the fucking president. Like, oh my God. Officer Eugene Goodman responded to the oh, initial I think breach. this is the, the Mitt Romney thing. You all may have seen footage of Officer Goodman previously, but there's more to his heroic story. In this security footage, you can see Officer Goodman running to respond to the initial breach. Officer Goodman passes Senator Mitt Romney and directs him to turn around in order to get to safety. On the first floor, just beneath them, the mob had already started to search for the Senate chamber. Officer Goodman made his way down to the first floor where he encountered the same insurrectionist we just saw watch breach the Capitol. In this video, we can see the riders surge toward Officer Goodman. Recall that the riders are in red and Officer Goodman in this model is in blue. Watch Officer Goodman who backs up the stairs.
I hate these fucking people. I'm paying for that. My specific tax dollars paid for this building that was built years before I was born. Welcome to America. This guy, like Jesus Christ. Like I want to say too, like there's a like, you know, we saw a lot of like confrontations between protesters and the police throughout uh, the summer, and there was like, just like sort of like speaking in like terms of just the dynamics that existed there. I don't think there was ever a moment where the police themselves like thought like I'm going to die in this moment or something like this. Right. But like, yeah, there's something about just like this black police officer who, who has to know, like this person probably is not ignorant about the history of America and probably not ignorant about the uh, makeup of this mob and is standing there staring down this like, confederate flag waving mob and just like jesus christ <laughs> so i gotta say like that's yeah. fucking intense no i agree and then still manage to like do something to potentially uh direct them in a, in a different direction I'm also like a boomer like I gotta figure out how to do some sort of fucking ad block for when I watch uh, more mainstream content because it seems to be very although they were shouting that they did not have any weapons we know from the earlier video that that's not true the second assailant through that breach was the one carrying a metal baseball bat we know there were other weapons there that day all right yeah, um, imagine seeing Kian in some of his never-before-seen footage. Exactly, yeah. I do, I, I still have to say, they paid Kian to go there. He flew to the insurrection. He bragged on Twitter that he took selfies with the people as they were getting tear-gassed. He was in that crowd. What did you do, Kian? I want to know. I want to know. I don't think we're ever going to know. They let him back into the country, you know. <laughs> Anyways, we are done. I've streamed for two hours. I'm probably going to, uh, maybe I should like flip a coin to decide whether I'm going to raid Famous Horse or Bad Praxis. Uh, or I'll just do Brad pa Bad Praxis, because I did, I did Famous Horse like a ton in a row. And so I think it's, it's nice to, to raid Bad Praxis. What the fuck are these things? What the fuck are what things? <laughs> what a random oh is it the highlighting the fact that you highlighted uh oh yeah because there's stream points so i guess now that i'm affiliate you get stream points i gotta learn all this stuff and then i can i can educate my fan base <laughs> oh I'm such a boomer thanks this was a lovely stream though i've enjoyed myself we released i will say we released a podcast episode today so that is the first thing I'm going to promote. And I think it was a really, really good podcast episode. I, uh, the topics were nice and I, they were funny. I, th I think, well, like elements of it were funny. I thought me and Caitlin had a great time making it. And so I encourage everyone to go check out the podcast. And plus the title name. The title name is fucking amazing. <laughs> I love my title names, but Rebel Spies and Proud Guys. <laughs> I love a title that uh, rhymes. It's a. It was it's cool. good. It's a good title. I like it. But uh, please go check it out. I, I thought it was a an awesome episode. I spent. I love now. We have sixty nine episodes. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
for a limited time only, 69 episodes. Nice. Uh, so please, go check that out. And I'll throw that in the, uh, the thing. But then also, please consider donating to us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Imperial News. It's, uh, it helps us uh, create better stuff. Uh, I mean, eventually I will get a... Maybe later. Get out of here. Eventually... We will get better equipment, and I'll be able to... Because right now I can't stream games because my computer sucks. You saw earlier in the stream, uh, for those who hung around, like uh, when, when Clara was sending me bits, I the video took a while to expand because I think like I'm using too much of my computer resources just to do what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Which, you know, watching videos and streaming, it shouldn't be that complicated, but my computer is, uh, you know, taking a shit. So... Eventually, we'll improve everything, uh, but that'll be a faster process if you consider donating to our podcast. And uh, we will be forever grateful. And uh, spread the word, please. Follow if you, you haven't followed already, and uh, let people know the, uh, what we do, and if you like it, and encourage them to come watch. And we can build our community. And I like having a community. In fact, I... I'm going to send you to people who I would consider part of my community in the left-wing streaming community, and that is Bad Praxis. They uh, they just do political content, kind of like what I do, but I'm more focused on the rebel, but they, they do just a, a general, a general uh, politics. I think they're based out of America, too, if I'm not mistaken. Good night, Siegelbaum. Thank you for showing up. Uh... Enjoy bad practice if you are going to go. And uh, Elrond, do you have any any closing thoughts for the uh, for the crowd? Good night, Nick. Don't do coups, everyone. <laughs> bad idea. Don't do it. That's I, me. I agree. It's me out. Um, well, you know, until we can do a leftist coup, enjoy bad practice. Goodbye. <laughs>